Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Hey everybody, welcome back. Mike Mallon here. I am joined today by a, a good friend and a colleague, or at least a colleague from a past life, that I trust quite a bit when it comes to pharmacology, and I've basically gone to with almost every pharmacological question I've ever had. Erin uh, Lingenfelter is here with me today. She is an emergency medicine pharmacist that works at the University of Utah. Erin and I worked clinically together for about 10 years, I think, Aaron, is that about right? It probably, yeah. Sounds about right. Up until just a few years ago. Um, and somehow I've managed not to blow up her phone every single uh, every single week since leaving the University of Utah. Uh, but it's been hard. I've had, to, I've had to hold back a few times. Aaron has put up with every single one of my uh, annoying questions since I was a resident and has, has been very gracious uh, with her time today to join us and uh, talk to us a little bit about her impression when it comes to chloroquine and just give us some, some background information regarding chloroquine chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in the setting of COVID. Erin, uh, so as I mentioned, Erin's currently an EM pharmacist at the University of Utah. Uh, she's also the coordinator of the EM pharmacy residency there, and she's also president of a, pharmac- of a pharmacy advocacy organization called Kappa Epsilon, which is a national pharmacy organization. Erin, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. And Mike's right. It's a good thing he hasn't blown up my phone after he graduated because I'm quite expensive after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aaron's, Aaron's been so great putting up with me for so many years. And, um, I, you know, I started diving into this chloroquine thing a little bit and immediately realized I was out of my league and I needed some help. And, uh, she was the first person that came to mind and then she tried to punt to someone else. And I said, absolutely not. I don't trust anyone else. <laughs> so, so Aaron, if, if you don't mind, I guess, first off, let me, let me ask how, how's it going? How's it going over there in Utah? How's Salt Lake city? How's, how's the COVID drama and the earthquake, I guess. Yeah, so in Salt Lake City and in Utah in general, it has a very um, long culture of emergency preparedness. We actually have a very, I think, highly developed emergency uh, management group that you know has a lot of resources and um, ma- money allocated to them. We do um, for years. We've done monthly, yearly drills for mass shootings, for bioterrorism, for uh, radiation exposure exposure. So our team has been practicing this kind of stuff really frequently over the years. Um, For us, um, we have our tents up for screening. We have a very, um, uh, I think, sophisticated process right now. We have designated units for uh, the emergency department and in our inpatient uh, flow. Um, We have what I think right now are a reasonable amount of resources and personal protective equipment, which is everyone's kind of talking about on social media. We're doing well now. Um, we are very cognizant that that may not always be the case, so we're being conservative as possible. Um, you know, I think our administrators and our physician leadership have been great during this. Um, maybe we don't always get along or agree at first, but we are definitely you know, gotten to the point where we are ready for the influx and surge. Um, actually, um, I was told that somewhere close to 50% of our um, inpatient beds are probably uh, unoccupied right now in anticipation of a surge. So I think the big thing for us right now is um, just like everyone, we don't know what's coming um, and we don't know what resources will be limited once the surge happens. But uh, I would say we're all on the same page. We know what's expected of us. We get daily updates. Um, I'm optimistically cautious about what's about to come. 
Good. Well, I mean, overall, that sounds that sounds really encouraging. Um, I know you guys have you guys have always seemed to have your your uh, your stuff together. Um, so I'm sure that you'll be prepared when when the moment comes. I wanted to specifically talk to you today a little bit about uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which are two medications that, as a, you know, a trained emergency physician. I don't have a lot of experience prescribing, um, and and now uh, emergency physicians and primary care physicians and pretty much everybody all throughout the world is considering using these medications on a rather regular basis, uh, based on really limited data um, that has come out regarding regarding COVID nineteen and, and a possible benefit. And I think that there's a lot of people out there that are, are really touting the benefits, um, probably over touting the benefits. And then there's a lot of people that are really naysaying the benefits. And my guess is the benefit is somewhere in between. Um, so I was hoping to talk with you a little bit about that. Can, can we just start off really simply and just talk about what is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine? How are they different? And what, 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 what do we have experience using them for? Sure. Um, so luckily, these are drugs that, like you mentioned, they've been around for a long time. Chloroquine was actually developed and first on the market in 1939. Um, hydroxychloroquine is a derivative of that drug. Essentially, it just has an additional side chain um, for a simplistic way of describing it. Um, it was developed in, I think, uh, put out in the 1950s, like 1955, as a uh, alternative to chloroquine, because chloroquine was seeing a lot of life-threatening toxicities with long-term use of it. So because it's superior to chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine is superior to chloroquine with less toxicities, we don't really see chloroquine in the U.S. that much anymore. Okay. It's pretty rare to actually see a prescription for that. I don't think I've seen a, uh, anyone on that for 10 years plus, unless it, they're coming from another country. Gotcha. Um, so like I said, we've had many, many years using these drugs and understand their benefits and their risks and what's normal during normal treatment. So what, what uh, one are... of the things I want to mention, I just saw today, Mike, sorry to interrupt, yeah. um, starting over. One of the things I saw today is there's a bunch of discussion on the internet of these chemicals being available from fish tank, uh, stores. <laughs> okay. uh, people use this, um, this chemical, you know, and it's a good drug is a chemical. Um, they use it to present, prevent diseases in their tanks, like amoebas and such. Um, and so between February 25th and March 2nd, a single 25 milligram bottle of chloroquine surged from $10 a bottle to over $500 a oh bottle. Oh my God. Uh, for fish so tanks. Can we just, <laughs> yeah, it's for fish tanks. So obviously people with very fa fancy fish tanks are very distressed right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so can we just put it on there that these chemicals from the internet are not meant for human consumption and please avoid them. Yeah. I think that's, I think that probably goes without saying, but we should say it out loud anyway. Um, so wh what do, what do we have experience using uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine for in the past? It's malaria, right? Yeah, it's malaria and malaria prophylaxis. So chloroquine's um, big use was really just anti-malarial. Um, different, uh, different species of malaria infection. Um, this uh, chloroquine was used for suppressive treatment, uh, maybe for acute attacks, and trying to lengthen uh, intervals between uh, treatments or relapses. Okay. Um, there's also some anti-amoeba um, use in non-intestinal infections. When we moved to hydroxychloroquine, we got got some benefits from it um, that chloroquine didn't have. So we also gained prophylaxis for malaria. Okay. Um, but away from that um, world, we started using it in rheumatological diseases. So the biggest ones are lupus, um, rheumatoid arthritis, and I think a non-FDA uh, discussion for a use in Sorgen's uh, syndrome has been uh, quite often. Gotcha. Okay. And, and do these drugs come with, uh, come with a lot of side effects typically? They do. Um, I think the biggest things that, um, we worry about that we've seen in the years of use of these drugs, um, are really high dose, long, um, long use. So the biggest ones we knew about were cardiomyopathy with high doses of long-term use, uh, hepatotoxicity, and then, um, there's some ophthalmol ophthalmologic, uh, uh, diseases and, uh, degradation that happens on this. Uh, in these drugs that I'm actually not that versed in, but I, I always remembered from pharmacy school, if someone came in complaining of certain uh, eye complaints on these drugs, we should bring our doctor's uh, attention to a potential differential being uh, an adverse drug effect. So when we use these drugs in uh, long-term rheumatoid uh, diseases, we also have been finding 
some different uh, reasons to use them in the antiviral world or in, in the viral disease world. So there's actually a, um, some in vitro studies in HIV hmm. um, that we're using uh, dose dependent suppression of uh, HIV uh, serotype type one and um, being used as alternative or in combined HIV treatments. Interestingly enough, those happen work better in patients with HIV plus some kind of room disease. We were using this uh, in doing some studies in the antiviral world with hydroxychloroquine. Gotcha. Um, so interestingly, because um, uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine actually um, have resistance patterns patterns in some of the malarial uh, uh, parasites. We actually stopped making a lot of this drug because we moved on to bigger, badder anti-malarials. Mm, okay. And and so we didn't have a ton of this drug just laying around. You know, when COVID hap- uh, started happening, um, we were using it for our lupus patients and our rheumatoid arthritis patients. And even then, we weren't having large amounts of drug available. Sometimes we were running into shortages even before COVID. So and yeah, I know there was some some precedent to expect that chloroquine might or hydroxychloroquine might actually have some benefit as an antiviral. Um, you know, and I and I did find one study I think that looked at um, sort of I think it was in vitro um, uh, treatment of hydroxychloroquine for SARS one virus as well as you know there's at least one mm-hmm. one out now for SARS two. So it's not a it's not a giant surprise that there there could potentially mm-hmm. be some benefit. Um, and there's, there's definitely some reports, although no randomized controlled trials or any real solid evidence yet, uh, to suggest that there is benefit. Do do we have any idea, um, whenever, whenever there's poor data on a subject, I kind of fall back on, on physiology and, and try to think about it from a scientific point of view. Uh, If there is a potential way that makes sense that this, this medication could be working, do we understand the mechanism well enough to, to lean on that? In COVID-19 or um, in uh, uh, SARS-COVID-1, for example, um, we kind of started theorizing. So here are some of the things we are wondering how it might work. Um, One of the things that particularly hydroxychloroquine does is it increases the pH of intracellular compartments in, in the virus. So what it does is it causes a suppression of like T cell activation and prevention of leukocyte chemotaxis. Um, What's interesting, particularly in this, is we think it's going to inhibit DNA and RNA synthesis. Might actually, it might impact the cell membrane pH itself, disrupting Mm -hmm. the virus's ability to fuse to its cell membrane. Okay, so potentially could be preventing adherence and uh, and and viral um, sort of uh, what is that liposomal uh, lysosomal uh, uptake or whatever of the of the virus and then RNA replication of the viral DNA basically is or yeah one of the things I think of it as is um, this uh, bug likes being acidic mm-hmm. this vi- virus likes being acidic and so you bring in this basic chemical into it and it disrupts its life cycle okay interesting there's another mechanism that we think it's also going to have some immunomodulating effects. And so we're thinking about it, it might inhibit IL-6 and IL-10 and try to mitigate that cytokine storm that's being described in COVID-19. Okay, interesting. So it could be actually decreasing cytokine production by some of your inflammatory cells and decreasing the likelihood of a cytokine storm, which is potentially why it might be beneficial. I mean, I guess both both mechanisms could potentially explain why it might be beneficial in uh, in, in patients with progressive disease. I mean, we're doing the best with the information we have, and I, it makes sense pathophysiologically. It's just whether or not we'll ever get the chance to go back and prove it. Right. So at this point, we've got <clears throat> at least two studies that I've seen um, that are I would describe as preliminary. That neither are randomized controlled trials. They are basically one. One that I've seen is sort of an observational study of patients who are receiving hydroxychloroquine um, as treatment for um, basically progressive disease, and that showed some benefit. And then there was another another study that I we just recently talked about that um, was uh, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin in patients, and that was kind of sort of randomized in a very loose description of the term of randomization. And is also pre-publication, so hasn't truly been uh, very well verified at this point. Where do you stand, uh, just personally, ab- about this in in terms of the potential benefit of hydroxychloroquine for COVID? Personally, I have gotten on board with hydroxychloroquine in very specific populations, um, knowing that no drug is benign, 
And throwing a drug at a patient without knowing their past medical history, other medications they're on due to severe drug interactions with hydroxychloroquine, I think would be irresponsible. Mm -hmm. But when you do have severe cases, and in, in my world, severe cases is admission to a hospital requiring oxygenation and potential ICU care, although no studies have been done in ICU patients to my knowledge thus far, um, the... The use um, for the mild cases, I'm I'm a little more hesitant in. And is that is that because of side effects mostly? Is, is that your concern? Yeah, I mean, let's talk about it a little bit. Like, if you want to have some nerdy pharmacist time, here it is. So <laughs> I'd love to have some nerdy <laughs> pharmacist time. Oh my god, we we there's so many different phrases for this, but we 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 call it nerding out. So um, let's just do hydroxychloroquine. Um, it goes a time to peak for moral ingestion is three hours, which is baller, right? You are able to get to a, uh, treatable concentration really quickly. Okay. It's bioavailability is very high, whether you take it with food or not. Okay. So don't have to do it IV. You can do it orally. Things that you have to remember, it's extensive liver metabolism and it has three active metabolites. So there is, you know, that downward uh, metabolism issues. It's excreted through the kidneys, but in no way would I be like, oh, if they have renal failure, I have to dose reduce. That, that's not the case. It's only about, I say 25% uh, renal excretion. Now, interestingly enough, in some of our patients who um, have uh, acidified urine and enhanced elimination, here's the, here's the kicker. The elimination half-life is about 40 days. Whoa. So meaning it will take 40 days for this drug to get out of the body. Okay. So typically when um, we talk about drugs that have a half-life of 40 days, I think about pretty irregular dosing, but this is something that I've seen even recommendations for BID dosing in, the treat, in actual treatment arms. So it's it's all about the um, metabolites. So it's about the active, you know, the actual drug at the site versus the metabolites. Okay, gotcha. One of the things that we talked about, like, who am I going to use this in? Who I'm not? And and I started thinking about the nerdy pharmacy things. I started thinking about um, all the contraindications and precautions I was taught, and and things that we've learned in the meantime. So some of the ones that I want to share with you guys is think about your patients with um, for contraindications potentially is patients with myositis gravis. Um, and it inhibits acetylcholine and esterase release. It has uh, issues in terms of postsynaptic neurons. So I wouldn't use it in myositis gravis patients. Okay. The other the other big one is QT pro, uh, interval prolongation. And although it's my job to, um, to like remind a doc every time there seems to be a drug interaction for QT prolongation. I'm not really the biggest subscriber for, you know, every drug causes QT prolongation, but in this one, I'm pretty on board that it does. Okay. So this is so, maybe a more aggressive uh, amount of QT prolongation, right? Right. And when you think about our patients and, and some of the medications they're on or some of the medications we're about to give them in this clinical setting, um, it could be very tricky. Uh, if you have patients that come in that have ventricular arrhythmias due to, um, particularly due to hyperkalemia or hypo, uh, mag, uh, hypermag or they're bradycardic, I would be really cautious in just throwing this at them. Gotcha. So let me just, um, uh, let's see your other, other, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to let, just describe sort of QT prolongation for the, for anybody who might be listening, who's not a physician. Uh, I think most physicians are aware of what that is, but QT prolongation is sort of an abnormality of the electrical conduction inside the heart and multiple medications can cause increased QT prolongation. Some of the most common ones are anti-nausea medications, antipsychotics, uh, but the list is extensive. And the, the re reason it's an issue is because if you prolong the QT too far, you can basically get ventricular arrhythmias, which can lead to, you know, death, uh, which, which is generally thought of as bad. So we try not to prolong the QT, especially if it's already prolonged. And a lot of the times when we're giving QT prolonging medications, we'll often get an EKG prior to giving the medication to make sure the person doesn't already have a prolonged QT and we're not making it worse. Uh, but I just wanted to, to go over that briefly. If you're a physician, you probably already know it, but patients likely don't. One of the other patients populations that we should really consider this being a risk benefit uh, consideration and, and maybe a contraindication would be patients that have a disease state called glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. It can cause a pretty profound hemolytic anemia in those patients. Okay. So then let's talk about the patients and all their drug interactions that this drug can cause. So hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are profound, uh, what we call CYP. 2D6 inhibitors. So that's an enzyme that drugs use to um, either be metabolized or activated. 
Um, but because this drug has such a long half-life, these drug interactions can uh, last for weeks after a dose. So here are my big concerns. We talked about that QT prolongation, and you mentioned some of the medications that that happens with. Um, but even some of the things that we don't remember that cause QT prolongation, you know, a lot of the antipsychotics can cause that. So Haldol, Joperidol, uh, antiemetics like Zofran, also known as Ondansetron. And then some of the drugs we're actually trying to give these patients if they have a coexisting pneumonia, uh, such as fluoroquinolones or azithromycin, both of those um, uh, drug drugs and drug classes have QT prolongation pretty solidly documented in the literature. You could see how you could easily get in a situation where you've got a patient who's got some nausea and you're giving them both you know, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and now, and along with that, you're treating their nausea with, with Zofran and now you've given them three QT prolongation medica medications at once, basically. I mean... If I'm going to go anecdotally with this, I've had at least three of my um, emergency medicine pharmacist friends say, you know, at admission, QTC is three, 460, which is well below most of our cutoff of 500 for getting kind of nervous about starting new medications, um, to getting Levaquin, Azofran, and uh, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and going up to a QTC of the 580s, 600s quite quickly. Whoa, yeah. So anecdotally it's there. Um, maybe I would recommend monitoring for it. If you're going to add medications on knowing where your patient's baseline is before you start a new one, um, and being very cognizant that those drug interactions are there. Um, I, I really worry about some of our cardiology patients in these, particularly ones that have baseline arrhythmias, uh, dysrhythmias. So a big, big scary one is increased di uh, digoxin concentrations. Um, we think about the populations that are being most affected by COVID right now or we're worried about. They talk about our elderly populations. A lot of these patients may be on medications like digoxin and causing digoxin toxicity. Um, think about the patients that are on amiodarone, defetilide, flecainide, uh, melexetine. These are all going to cause major drug interactions with uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. I worry about our seizure uh, pa uh, patient population. Uh, Antiepileptics like uh, phenobarbital, carbamazepine, and phenytoin can actually increase the metabolism of hydroxychloroquine, meaning more drug will be eliminated. The concentrations you need at the lungs or uh, for that cytokine uh, release and, and storm that we worry about, it, they may not have a high enough concentration to actually treat them. We'll be giving them a drug that doesn't work. And then I think about our diabetic patients. Um, this drug is pretty notorious for causing increased hypoglycemia for weeks after a dose. And particularly in those patients who are on you know, any kind of insulin or oral anti-diabetic uh, medications like sulfon or ureas. So we're not talking, you know, just, you know, the general population. We're talking about a lot of our patients potentially not being candidates for getting this drug. Um, some of the more nuanced drug interactions, beta blockers, uh, metoprolol, carvedilol, propanolol, um, their metabolism may be inhibited, meaning they're going to have increased effects of beta blockers um, causing life-threatening bradycardia or hypotension potentially. And then one that could affect almost any population. Think about our, um, a large amount of patients who are on antidepressants like serot uh, serotonin re uh, reuptake inhibitors um, or SNRIs is another class. So particularly things like Prozac or Paxil or Effexor or Cymbalta, um, we're seeing increased risk of serotonin syndrome in those patients. And here's the kicker. You're going to love this one. Um, opioids like um, uh, hydrocodone, they're showing increased analgesic effects uh, due to reduced conversion to metabolites. And so we're seeing potential opioid overdoses in conjunction with using this medication. So I would like to recommend to everybody who's um, using these medications to pull up a really cool resource. Um, it's called the Liverpool COVID-19 Drug Interactions page. It has a beautiful chart of all the different COVID treatments that are being um, investigated and, and potentially used in patients right now. So if it's any of the antivirals, if it's any of the antibiotics, um, there's about a nice grid of like 15 medications that it compares to all the different drug classes um, to really give you a good source of why there may be a drug interaction in that patient. That's, that's great advice. As you're saying all these things, Aaron, I'm getting less and less excited about hydroxychloroquine, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I, I mean, 
you know, like I'm, I'm a lucky human being. I'm relatively healthy. I don't take any medications. Um, but I think about as a pharmacist, like I hyperventilate on medication and drug interactions and maybe I'm over, uh, uh, attuned to this issue, but I, we have this like do no harm thing in commonality between physicians and pharmacists and, and one of my jobs is to stop bad drug interactions. So I, I've maybe hyper attenuated on it, but it, it is something that really bothers me. No, I mean, I think just to sort of verify some of your concern, I think that everything that we do in medicine is really a risk benefit analysis. Like there's, there's very few things that we truly do that have absolutely no risk. Uh, just about everything is going to have some risk. So we have to think about what are, what are the known risks for this intervention and what are the, what are the known, uh, benefits in this case, we've got a medication with some substantial risk when it's associated with drug interactions. Like granted, you know, you take a healthy 30 year old person who's not on any other medications, relatively low risk, right? But mm -hmm. if you take the majority of these patients that have severe disease, which is the majority of these patients who have severe disease and, and right. those people are on lots of other medications for their comorbidities. Now we're talking about a substantial risk. And then you compare that to the potential benefit, which I mean, while, uh, while described as there by, you know, people on the front lines, people using it saying there's definitely improvement in severity of symptoms. And, and based on this one study, there's some decreased viral viral load associated with chloroquine. There's no strong studies to say, to say that, you know, 30% of people are going to get better on chloroquine. We, we just don't have that yet. So now we're really talking about using something with some substantial downsides uh, for something with an, sort of an unknown benefit, which is a, definitely on the fringe of comfort, I think, for most people. I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think we're in an era right now where a lot of people are getting their information from the internet and from the news. And I think people are grabbing onto anything that makes them feel safer, that makes them feel less panicky, lets them think, I have an option if I get it. And, you know, I know doctors' phones are, offices' phones are off the hook right now of patients calling and asking for these prescriptions. Mm -hmm. I know pharmacies are getting called on the hour, if not more frequently, asking, do you have this drug in stock? Um, it, it, it is something that we as professionals, especially when we have the opportunity to take five minutes, educate ourselves and decide, yes, this is an option that I would like to try, but I need to know who not to use it in or how to mitigate the potential uh, downfall of other subsequent issues that may happen after the fact. Um, just being aware is half the battle, I think. So I think that, um, I, I guess, l let me tell you where, where I'm coming from, from it, uh, in this, uh, from the, from the standpoint of how to use chloroquine at this point, just after talking to you briefly. Um, and I'm shooting off the hip from on this one. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it makes sense to me in, in otherwise healthy people who aren't on a ton of medications that this is a, a fairly low risk medication that may offer some benefit. So imagine a world where we have as much chloroquine as we could possibly need to treat every person or hydroxychloroquine, uh, to treat every person in the world, it might make sense to give it to, you know, some of the, some of the even more mild or moderate cases of people who are otherwise healthy, those people that have comorbidities and are on lots of other medications. That's when we, I think, you know, at least from my standpoint, I would definitely be getting the assistance of a pharmacist to help me make the, the decision on, is it safe to use this medication and also probably get an EKG and monitor closely for side effects of any potential drug, drug interactions. That's sort of my like first first brush thought about the medication in general. Yeah. And I'll, I'll probably throw that, throw one more tip in there, uh, for most, uh, institutions, you know, and not uh, private phys uh, physicians don't have this benefit, but most institutions, pharmacies very involved in getting med history lists. I will tell you, most of us are being pulled off the front lines to do those med history lists for physicians. Make that HMP as abbreviated as it is in this patient population. Include, please tell me what important medications you're on, and, and and probe them a little bit. Are you on medications for your heart? Are you on diabetes meds? Is there any, you know, are you on antidepressants? And hopefully they'll offer up saying, oh yeah, I'm on, um, because a lot of these patients we're going to see, we're going to have no idea their past medical history. Certainly. So one of the thing that I wanted to, to talk to you about is this concept of prophylaxis, which does not have any strong data backing it mm -hmm. at this point. And, and I think we can sort of 
dovetail that conversation into an ethical conversation because I know one of your comments is probably likely going to relate to the amount of chloroquine available uh, for the population. Mm -hmm. What what do you think about uh, the idea? I know that there's at least one study going on currently looking at hydroxychloroquine uh, for prophylaxis. No current 